Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending our PCB Manufacturing Facilities Certifications, Compliance, and Security webinar. My name is Ed McMahon. I'm the CEO here at Epic. Before we get started, I want to let you all know that we're, you're going to be muted during the presentation. If you have any questions as we move along, go ahead and enter them in the questions panel located at the webinar control panel, and we're going to go ahead and answer a few at the end, but if you put a question, we'll make sure that we will get back to you by email as we normally don't have time uh, for all the questions. Also, uh, we're going to be recording this webinar and posting both the recording and the slide deck on our website, YouTube channel. As many of you know, uh, Epic has been manufacturing print circuit boards since 1952. So uh, for over 70 years, we've been a leader in the PCB industry with plants here in the US and abroad. And this marks the 20th year for me in this business uh, as I acquired Epic in uh, 2003. Uh, the webinar title and agenda is a little clunky today. Um, I apologize for that. But in essence, what it is, it's uh, uh, this webinar is based upon the questions that we have been spending a lot of time with our customers answering because there's a lot of things that are going to be uh, presented today where we're just seeing there's a lot of confusion out there on what these certifications are, on how to meet certifications and specifications. So our view was let's create a resource for folks and let's get some of these things out um, so we can give our customers and, and others the opportunity to go look at uh, these items for themselves as they move forward. So that's really what our, 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 our goal is here today, is to kind of deep dive a little bit into uh, some of these specific topics. So to start with a couple of uh, definitions, right? So for printed circuit boards, everything starts right here. And really for all uh, electronics assemblies, everything starts with the IPC standards. And this di a diagram to your right is what's called the IPC standards tree, right? And it's basically where everything when it comes to acceptability is, is started, and that's where it's all specified. Today, um, we're really gonna focus on these three areas here, which are really based upon, or focused on the, uh, the, the bare printed circuit board side, as that's where uh, our expertise lies, and that's where a lot of some of the confusion really has been over the past couple of months. So what do these, these specification numbers stand for? Well. The specific specifications that you see here are basically what we use as an industry to determine the acceptability of different products. The whole idea is that there is one set of standards that everybody is held to. So there's no, there's no opportunity for uh, judgment when you're talking about the acceptability of whether it's a print circuit board or an electronic assembly. There's also ones for cable assemblies, but the reality is that they came up with these, the IPC did, to ensure that we would all be measured and that we'd all be producing to the same standard. And now you're seeing a lot more of these created as more technology starts to develop. You know, you look there now, there's there's flex and rigid flex, there's uh, high frequency microwave boards, because as we, as these technologies begin to proliferate into our industry, we want to make sure that they're unique characteristics and their unique attributes are defined as well so that we can again continue to have only one set of standards for acceptability of product and then there's a, a different set of specifications unlike uh, the previous set which is around how we uh, determine if an end product is acceptable these particular types of specifications are more around the materials that we use and about creating a standard so that there's not when as you as many of us who've been around when you can remember things like you know g10 material or everybody knows what fr4 is but unfortunately not all fr4 is the same not all polyamides are the same so the way that the ipcs manage this is that they've created a set of standards so that we can group materials into different um, what we'll call slash numbers and we're going to talk a little bit about that a little bit later so you'll know a little bit more about what that means. So another set of de definitions I kind of wanted to go through was PCB facility certifications and kind of what they mean. So to start with, we're going to start with the, the good old fashioned mill 55110. Uh, and this had been in place for a long time and it's really the military general spec for print circuit boards. As everybody's also probably aware, uh, 31032 is the current specification since 1998. 
for a facility to become certified, right? They have to go through a couple things. They have to have their, their quality management system um, reviewed by a technical review board, and then it's gotta be re reviewed for its effectiveness. So the quality management system is the first part of it, making sure that their quality management system meets the specification. And then secondly, they have to demonstrate capability. Very simple, it's, it's almost the same process for UL certification. So to become certified, depending upon what you want to become certified for, and that's by layer count, by material type, you then get a set of files, you produce the circuit board, you and you submit for um, uh, approval those boards, coupons, and all the other documentation that's required. And then if you pass that, you then become certified. And then there's several other additional a yearly submission requirements of parts and coupons and storage of the debt documentation, but won't go into all the details of that here. But as you can see, this is one where you actually have to submit product. And again, it's depending upon lots of stuff. If you have, if you're approved for 12 layer polyamide, that means that that's what you can do 12 layers and below. That means you can't make a 14 layer when it comes to a requirement for you to be certified to that specification. And the other one we see a lot is AS9100, right? And AS9100 is really the aerospace standard um, when, it, when it comes to, it, very similar to IS, right? They're basically the same concept, except the AS9100 standard is a little bit more stringent in a bunch of areas, and it's focused on more on the aerospace industry. And to become certified on this, you're going to have an audit to make sure that your company's quality management system adheres to the requirements. And then once you become approved, you then go through the surveillance audit, audits um, and you are now approved to manufacture to that standard. And a lot of it with this side of it is that, again, it's a lot of documentation differences um, and, and ways to uh, manage different documentation that we'll kind of go over here in a minute. This is part of um, one of the big things when you talk about AS9100 is the balloon drawings that you have to do on every one of the printed circuit boards that you ship out. And it talks about measuring every single attribute on the board. And having inspection software, which is this, this inspection expert, and having a CMM, which is a computerized machine that does all of the, the uh, dimensional measurements, is something that's really required here. Can you do an AS9100 report without it? Absolutely. It's a lot of labor hours. So one of the benefits of, if you're going to do this, is to have this type of investment so that you can get through it relatively quickly um, and to do it relatively accurately is you're sitting there with calipers and pin gauges. It's a whole lot more difficult than if you have uh, a piece of equipment doing it. So the big difference between these two right, is 31032 requires you to submit an actual printed circuit board or to be tested to meet a certain standard, where AS9100 is really your quality system meets a certain standard. So there's a difference between the two of them, and especially when it comes to printed circuit boards, as to how printed circuit board factories are measured when it comes to these particular standards. Typically, or typically, I shouldn't say that, Lately, we have been seeing two different types of requests. If you see um, on, a, on a print that this board must be manufactured at a mill 31032 certified facility, that is cut and dry, very clear, um, and it, there's no question about what it is. A lot of times, though, what we're seeing is that instead of it saying that, it says in accordance with the mill 31032 specification or in accordance with the AS9100 specification. What that means, depending upon the fabricator, for us specifically, is that we use the IPC class three as the standard for product inspection and for acceptability. And then we follow the required specification for things that may be more stringent. For example, the AS9100, the AS9100D form, everybody knows about that needs to be filled out. MIL 31032 has a bunch more stringent areas, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, um, in a minute. But Specifically, the way that coupons are managed and kept, right? MIL 3032 has a specific type of coupon that you have to use. Um, the sampling plan used for inspection is a lot more stringent. Um, and then in many instances for 31032, 31032 
requirements is that you have to send certain coupons to third-party labs um, for conformance inspection. So why is this, why is in accordance with accepted? Well, there's a couple of reasons, right? One is that the ISO 9001 certification means that you already meet the 3032 quality management plan requirements. So we are, we're, we're already in accordance with it because we're using that specification. As many of you know, IPC class three is the spec now for high reliability print circuit boards. And in many instances, what we're finding is a lot of the larger defense contractors are just blatantly coming out with IPC class three and they're not requiring no at all. And mostly because of the fact that that specification, they're really close. There are some minor differences, right? One of a couple of them look like this, where you know annular ring for IPC class three is two and one external and internal versus five and two for mill. And so in many instances, they'll customers will want us to meet that annular ring spec for their print circuit board, and we can, we're happy to do that. And it's it's something that most factories are capable of doing. Um, it's just understanding what the customer is looking for. Another one of the another one of the um, um, uh, differences is the test coupons, right? IPC coupon design is really focused on representing what the circuit pattern is versus the mill. There's just a standard coupon that's basically used for everything, and it doesn't really represent what the circuit is. So moving a step further, you know, IPC class two is the one that that is used for general electronic products, right? And it's a lot more cost effective. It's it's a lot less in terms of um, uh, uh, it's a lot better in terms of yield, what you can and can't accept versus class three, right? Class three has some very strict requirements. And I just put one of them in here so that you can see the difference. And this is the, the minimum copper thickness in through holes and blind and buried vias when it's above two layers. If you look at class three, that's a 25% average copper in the hole increase over class two. And when you think about that, that's a lot of the reason why class three and mill parts are a lot more expensive than class two, right? Because how do you get that 25% copper, more copper in the hole? You have to leave the panels in the plating bath for that much longer, right? So that's why when you'll see that there's a substantial difference in class two and class three pricing and mill pricing from uh, your manufacturers. So we're looking at some of the other IPC specs. This is the 4101, the slash sheet that we talked about. And why is it called a, a slash sheet? Well, um, if you can see my cursor here, you can see that the, the specification sheet number, and these are the, this is the summary page that goes through all the different uh, 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 specifications. It's IPC 4101 slash 40. Right? This one happens to be a polyamid material uh, that has a 200 degree C glass transition temperature and every one of them are going to be a little bit different. Um, but the reason that these were done was so that this is, as you can see from this particular sheet, the top is exactly the same as the previous slide that I sent you. But for a laminate to be able to classify for this slash number, it has to meet the requirements that the IPC specified, right? Remember we talked about FR4 is FR4. It's not, right? There's many different types of FR4, and what the IPC wanted to do was create 15 different parameters that allowed that, that, that allowed people to be, if they wanted to make a laminate and it wanted to be called a slash 21, and it's a, this, is, this is the traditional old FR4, it's only 110 a TG, so it's a really lower end product versus some of the real high end stuff today, but it still has to meet all of these specifications, otherwise it will not fall into this class it'll have to go down to another level or up to another level if you want it to move up. But all these manufacturers, every single manufacturer that makes laminate, for every single product that they have, they will be able to tell you which one of these IPC specifications that this particular material is, is uh, compliant with. And again, there's many, right? There's a lot of different specifications that certain materials uh, will meet. So from a certifications point, as a summary, right? 31032, actual product verification. AS9100, that the quality management system is verified to meet what the aerospace industry has said that they would like to see. 
and that in accordance with is IPC class three as basis, and then uses the specific parts of the mill and, and AS um, certifications that aren't covered. So hopefully what we're trying to do there is create a little more clarity, as dusty as it can be, between these two um, certifications. Now we want to talk a little bit about, well, how do you know that a facility is actually meeting the certification or the specification requirements, right? Because that's really now the, the second most important thing after we understand what the certifications or specifications are, right? And typically, right, a lot of times what you're going to get are very rudimentary and basic inspection reports, right? And, and, and a lot of people just say, okay, well, listen, a path electrical test, you know, all the dimensions checked out based upon this report that I had. So at that particular point, that's enough for us to move forward. Well, unfortunately, when you look at it, right, a lot of this documentation with things like this is pretty basic and it's a lot of check the box stuff, right? And so, unfortunately, this doesn't really tell you much about whether or not you're meeting, especially some of the higher end specifications that we're dealing with today. And what we really want to call the real critical issues of performance in any print circuit board, right? Things such as, right, copper thickness in the hole, dielectric thickness between layers, quality of the connections, you know, making sure that you have actual connections to the, between the sidewalls of the hole and the inner layer, right? VFL consistency, especially with, you know, a VM pad uh, uh, designs today. Uh, the solder dam adhesion, you know, to, you know, when you're talking about really tight dams and you don't know if they actually are actually going to stick to the board until you go to put the, the solder on them and all of a sudden it's too late and you're having shorts. Um, the quality of the cap plating is another thing that we're seeing a lot of now and surface finish type and spec. You know, one of the areas that is, it's easiest to short cycle are things like gold plating, right? And many customers don't have the ability to measure not only the type, but the thickness of the surface finish. And that creates a touch of a challenge because then again, you don't know if you're meeting the spec until after it's too late. Right. And again, it's an easy thing for factories to do is to short cycle plating. And all of a sudden you're having issues with your soldering or you're having issues with your long term reliability with your board. You know, one of the things that's interesting, and this is an IPC document um, that uh, these are 42 different failures that can happen inside of a printed circuit board that that it, that you would not be able to see in that inspection report that I showed you earlier. And one of the unintended consequences of, of the entire planet moving to a Rojas and a lead-free environment is that when we used to have higher level and that used to be the number one coding for the printed circuit boards, every panel would go through a 250 degree C thermal shock right? That's basically what hotter level was, right? You would dip the whole panel into 250 degrees C um, molten bath of solder, and you would pull it out, and two air knives would basically take all of the excess solder off and leave you with your panel. One of the things that that did is that it created that thermal shock, which would expose many of the things that you're looking at here, because it's very difficult to find these things any other way that's really how you find a lot of the stuff that's in here unless you know how to look, right? So when you look at certain cross-section reviews, and these are things that we have found over time, right? One of the biggest things is, you know, dielectric thickness and interlayer copper. When are your manufacturers actually demonstrating to you that they not only have the, the proper amount, the minimum amount of dielectric thickness, but is the copper weights what they need, right? The one in the middle there is debris in a blind via. Right. And again, blind vias are a difficult, difficult technology. Right. Because why? Because how do you typically plate and get material in a via? Traditionally, in through hole vias, you get material going through the entire via, which then plates the sides of the holes, which creates your interconnect. Well, when you have a blind via like this, unfortunately, in many instances, you don't have the opportunity to have the material go through the entire hole. That's a problem. Right. Plated shut vias, this one on the right. Right now, with, with the features getting so small that 
on holes that are a certain size, rather than try to, to, to fill a via with conductive or non-conductive material, we're gonna plate those vias shut with specialized equipment, right? But this is something that wouldn't pass, but it'll pass the electrical test, right? But this is basically a plated shut via void. In this particular instance, fluid got in there and was and, and never got out. So that's what caused our challenge. Some additional cross-section reviews, things that a lot of folks wouldn't see. The one on the left here is a diagnetic electric thickness fail. As you can see, there are two different uh, copper uh, weights. The internal is a, one, a, a two ounce on the bottom and a half ounce on the top. The reality is that when you do that, you have to take that into consideration when you're put doing your stack up and make sure that you have enough prepreg to ensure that you have a minimum dielectric thickness between those two. And unfortunately, in this particular instance, this one didn't have enough in the stack up. Um, this lamination void is another one that, again, really hard to find unless you know what you're looking for. And you're not going to find that being an issue until you apply a lot of heat or until after your, your print circuit board is in the field. This one over here to the left, what you can see here is it's a, it's a whole D smear feature. This, this, this pad that's on the inner layer, clearly that the material when it D smear after drill didn't get taken off. So there's no connection on this side, right? Now there's, it's gonna pass electrical test because the other side is connected. So it's gonna pass electrical test, but you really don't have full connection with the actual through hole. So one of the things we wanted to point out here is the difference between how cross sections are done in Asia and in the US. A lot of times in Asia, especially when it's a very higher volume or, 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 or a board that's, that needs to be cost effective, they usually take it out, take a, a section from the board itself, right? And what you can see here is they just take a square out of the middle of one of these boards and then they go ahead and create their cross section. Here in the US, almost everybody uses coupons, right? Four coupons here, as you can see on each individual corner. Now, why is that? Well, there's several reasons. The first one is cost. If you didn't have to use these coupons, you could almost fit two more boards onto this panel. So your yield goes up by 30%, right? So that's one way to increase your yield and to minimize your cost. Secondly, is that it's much more difficult, especially on through holes, to get the specification and meet the specification on the outer parts of the board than it is on the inner parts of the board. Right, especially when you know you're kind of isolated out here, these holes are going to be much more difficult to get plated the right way and to the specification than all these in the middle. So it's a much more difficult mechanism to actually and, and coupons in many instances are there to be board for board to be a represent representation because if you look at the diagonal between this 18 by 24 inch panel, there could be a big difference between corner to corner of the actual panel in terms of plating and other and other particular issues, right? I mean, if you think about this, this board could have something like 25,000 holes in it, this panel, right? So the quality of the, the actual, uh, the actual hole, holes over here in the corner versus over here in the corner could be substantially different, which is why the coupons are used in the US because it's the most difficult way to be able to measure your, uh, uh, your quality. So what are the rules on cross-section? So traditionally, IPC 2221 gives you the coupon requirements. And as you can see, right, they, they basically tell you that you need opposing corners if you're gonna put coupons on panels because that's the true way to measure a plated hole evaluation and internal annular ring evaluation, right? So that's why we use coupons here where if it's not specified that you need coupons, a lot of times in Asia, in lower cost applications, they're gonna use one right off the board. So what if you don't need a coupon, right? But you still wanna make sure that your, your through holes and other things are, uh, are done in a way that gives you the best representation of what your board is actually like. As you can see on this board, um, it's kind of in a wide open area where there's not a lot of through holes. There was a couple of surface mount pads not a great place to do a section, right? When, especially when, you know, you've got an area like where this quad pack is here on the right side of the board, 
right? Where you can actually see there's a lot more holes in a much more denser area. So you're gonna wanna make sure that if you're going to ask for a coupon or for a cross section, that you get it in an area that is gonna give you a very good indication of the quality that you're getting. And one of the things that we do, especially if we don't need and we have a we and we have a um, a higher volume or a lower cost application is we'll put on our prints where we want the cross section taken from, right? Again, everybody recognizes that in the middle of a BGA section like this, that's going to have blind and variance. That's where you're going to want to take it from. But part of the challenge with some manufacturers is that a lot of times it's just easier to take it elsewhere where it's not going to be as uh, as revealing in many instances. So that's why they don't do that. But this is something that customers can do to be able to help protect themselves. Because again, if you're gonna put a coupon on and it's gonna reduce your panel yield by 30%, this is another way to do it that gives you a really good indication of how or what you're getting when it comes to the internal uh, attributes of the part. So the last thing I'm gonna talk about here today is ensuring uh, that your data and your supplier systems are secure. And this is something that's hitting uh, really true to home today as one of the largest suppliers of equipment to the print circuit board industry as a publicly traded company, it's over $4 billion in revenue. Um, we have one of our two plasma uh, machines down at our, our Dallas, Texas facility. Uh, it, it went down two days ago and we have a part that we need that they have, but they got hit with a ransomware attack and they haven't been able to ship it yet because of it. And they can't even tell me when they're gonna be able to ship it. So one of the things about, about keeping data secure is most companies now know how to manage ITAR, right? And almost everybody has, has secure FTP sites to transfer files. And everybody knows that you're not you know, supposed to email certain you know, ITAR uh, documents and ITAR data. Everybody kind of gets that. Does it still happen? It happens every day. But for the most part, most people know better. But now there's some new requirements. You've heard these new these new things like NIST and DFARS and, and ISO 27001. And they're all there for the protection of information, right? It's really around cybersecurity management is what we're really talking about. So when you hear these things, you can see the difference is they're pretty great, right? The one that came out, the one that's the most common, I would say, right now is NIST. And this is, is a cybersecurity framework, right? To help try to reduce their cybersecurity risk. This framework is voluntary. And, and unfortunately, or fortunately, it allows customers to self-certify themselves, right? Which in itself is somewhat counterintuitive. Um, DFARS is a, is a set of for, for the defense contractors. It's kind of shifting towards CMMC certification, which will require third party. Um, it's kind of been a moving target here recently as now they're looking at what size of uh, suppliers are gonna need to are gonna need to have certification and what level they're gonna need to have. But over the next two years, they're probably gonna figure that part of it out. And then thirdly is the new ISO 27001 which is the globally recognized security standard like all the other ISOs, like the AS9100 we talked about earlier. It not only requires third-party certification uh, and yearly audits, but it's really the highest standard uh, that, that organizations really can follow. So why is this important for the printed circuit board business? Well, a couple of reasons, right? One, every single PCB manufacturer, that's the domestic manufacturer, works with Asian suppliers, whether they're buying printed circuit boards and selling them to their customers, or whether they're buying machinery or whether they're buying laminate, they're working with Asian suppliers. The majority of PCB brokers work exclusively with Asian suppliers. And unfortunately, a lot of this, this, this cybersecurity issues are coming from that part of the world, right? Right, wrong, or different, that's where they're coming from. And then smaller companies really don't have the financial resources to be in true compliance. And self-certification has created this false sense of security amongst many customers because they feel like, oh no, they've got their NIST certification. Well, they really don't have a certification. They just self gone through and audited and checked a few boxes and nobody is really making sure that what they're actually putting down there is, is legitimate. So, you know, 
what is it that you need to be concerned about? Well, a couple of things, right? One is that, like I said before, everybody knows that you can't send ITAR files uh, to Asia, right? And that's been a pretty, a pretty standard thing for our industry for a long time. But every single day, we get five to 10 data packages like this. It's got the data PCB data, it's got the schematics, it's got the bill of materials. We often get them that have software in it, right? And you know, we'll go through as our company and we take all this information and we parse it out and only grab the stuff that we need. Everything else goes into another folder uh, inside of our, 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 uh, our encrypted system. So nobody ever sees that again. But the majority of data is vulnerable when it's on somebody's PCB hard drives or in emails, right? And that's where, people can go in and get information because a lot of times there's no firewall. A lot of times there's no security that keeps them from doing it, right? A lot of times we're starting to see things like now where, where certain actors in Asia are going in and they're intercepting email conversations and they are changing one letter of an email address and jumping into the conversations and doing things like, oh, I need this piece of information from you. Or doing things like, hey, I want to change my payment information so you pay this new bank. And a lot of that's what's happening now. And a lot of what these security standards are trying to do is keep these types of things from happening uh, to, to us and to our customers. So what's the best way to protect yourself, right? Well, look, there's a couple of things, right? One is you, you really want to have suppliers to have your third-party verified certification. And that's common. Right. Over the next two years, it's going to be almost a, it's absolutely going to be a must if you want to deal with defense contractors. Right. You want to minimize the data that you're sending. Right. I'm a printed circuit board manufacturer. I don't need your bill of materials. I don't need your schematic. And I certainly wouldn't want you to send it to me. Right. So you don't need to. And many times you can send passwords sent in different format, right? If you're worried about, you know, your, your, your email or somebody else's email not being encrypted, you can send something and then you can text somebody a password or you can send them a different email at a different time what a password is. And then understand what your supplier is actually doing, right? I mean, some of the stuff that, that here at Epic that we're doing are things like we looked at here, you know, SonicWall, Sophos, Mindcast, the tools that we're using and that we're implementing, you know, to you know make sure that we're protecting you guys and, and our data from being at risk, right? And it's, it's a lot of investment. You know, and, and it's a lot of frustration in many instances because, you know, right now we're going through the ISO 27001. We're going to have that done by the end of Q1. But the tr the, the internal training that has to go on, you know, the amount of phishing uh, uh, drills that we have to do where, you know, we have an outside third party that's sending phishing emails to our employees trying to see, if, make sure that they're following the training they've been given. And they have to do training once a quarter. Right? So it's a lot of investment, not only of the equipment and the software, but of your people's time, because it's really important because all it takes is one email to get through and it can cause an awful lot of havoc uh, inside of your organization. If you wanted to see more information about something, the things that we're doing, we have a blog post that got posted earlier this month, and it really came from the same type of thing that we're talking about here is that we have so many customers who are coming to us, ask us if we meet these certain standards, and it's hard because everybody's got a different one. So what we try to do is come up with a, a, a question and answer that kind of talks about the things that we're doing so you can see what it is that we've implemented inside of our organization. And that's why we spent the money. And it costs about $100,000 just to get that ISO 27001 certification after you've paid for all of the hardware, software, training, and then the actual certification itself. So in summary, right, a couple of things to keep in mind. Not all specifications are the same as we kind of identified. Um, cybersecurity requires significant investment to be protected, right? And we talked a little bit about that here most recently. The IPC and mill specs are complicated, but your fabricator knows how to get you what you need. So if you're not at all clear, talk to your, specif talk to your fabricator. They'll help you put the specification together on your drawing before you send it over. That way you're all very clear on what it is you're gonna get. And then lastly, you know, be specific um, in what you want for quality documentation so that you'll never be surprised, right? If you want the generic and it's CFC, then that's fine. But if you need more than that, let's you know, put that in your drawing. Make that a part of what you do every time to make sure that you're not gonna 
ever be surprised with finding out that you're not really getting all the information that you need. So um, Ryan's gonna put together all the questions and he's gonna fire them over to me here in a minute. And then we'll go through a couple of them um, just to give you a little more information on us. As many of you know, we uh, our, our facility, our PCB manufacturing facility is located in uh, outside of Dallas. Um, you know, we've been, we're up to 75 employees now doing a lot of high tech uh, flex, rigid flex and rigid print and circuit boards down there. Um, you know, the print and circuit board industry in the U.S. has really gone through some tough times. Um, and we saw, we're seeing that three more facilities um, about to close that uh, TTM has decided are going to be closing. So, you know, the print and circuit board industry is really, really getting tight in the U.S., but our facility continues to be invested in down in Dallas. And then some other products um, for all of you that we manufacture uh, here in the U.S., uh, along with uh, many of these we manufacture uh, over in Asia as well. So some of the questions, let's talk about this one. First one is, should I list the specific material that I want my PCB to be made on or use the IPC slash number? Very good question, and there's pros and cons to both. Um, if you say, listen, I want my material to be 370HR, that's great because now you know specifically that you're going to get that 370HR every single time. You don't have to worry about any changes in, in, in performance, so that's great. The downside to that is, is that if 370HR have, a tr have trouble getting it, I can't substitute anything. So that's one of the challenges if you specify a specific laminate is that I can't, there's, at that point, I cannot go to a different product based upon somebody, you know, what somebody else may have that is very similar because we have to do that. So that's the only real downside if you go ahead and specify out um, what, what material you want. Next question is how do I, how do I inspect the cross section when uh, I have a PCB factory sent it to me? Well, traditionally the way that we do it, and all those pictures that you saw are with a microscope with a camera. Um, however, there are companies out there that will take a printed circuit board from any factory and will do cross sections for you. And you can pay them to do it. And they're third party labs and they'll do a section. They'll even do thermal cycling on a printed circuit board. They'll and you can you can identify and you can show them exactly where you want these tests to be done, right? And again, we talk about a thermal shock, right? You can take uh, a lot of you take bare boards, order extras many times, and go ahead and you know put them under extreme heat, and you'll find things like voids. You'll find things like delamination. You'll find things like the pads coming off if you submit that those products those parts to extreme heat, you'll find that you're gonna find out if there's problems. And the higher the layer count, layer count, the more complex the board, the more you wanna do that type of analysis, right? Because if you look at that printed circuit board that's in the middle of this, uh, of this slide right here, this one's a 16 layer. I wanna say there's something like 13,000 holes in that part. And there's a, a lot of opportunities. It's got blind and buried vias. It's got, it's got uh, a, uh, plated plated shut holes. There's lots of opportunities to have challenges. So if you submit that board to thermal stress, you're going to find out if, in fact, it's going to pass what you need it to pass. Just like we do, and in many instances, we used to do more of when we were doing a hotter level. So thank you again for joining our webinar today. If you if we didn't get to your question, we were gonna we typically send out a blog post to everybody with all the questions that were asked, and we'll get that out to everybody here. You know, and please visit our website. We have over 54 different videos of webinars like this on all of our different products. And again, it's the tools are there for our customers and others to use. So thank you again, and everybody have a good weekend.